The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Looks like we have a nice crowd in attendance. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day and spending some time with PSMJ. Welcome to PSMJ Podcast Presents, Stress Test Your Firm to Assure Financial Sustainability in Uncertain Times. Today's expert is Brian Flynn. He's author of Maximizing Engineering Firm Profits. But before we turn to Brian in our conversation, let me cover just a, cu a couple of housekeeping items. I know people are used to this, but we do have a Q&A box that we use. If someone has a question, just please fill that out. We'll try to get to it during the presentation. If we don't, uh, we'll even leave some time at the end. So um, try to get to everyone's question. But if we don't, I know Brian will reach out to and follow up with whoever needs his help. Also, PSMJ is an AIA CES provider and with this presentation has been approved by the AIA. By attending this live presentation, you earn one LU hour or one PDH credit. To receive the LU Hour, email your AIA number to customerservice at psmj.com. To receive the one PBH credit, you can submit your certificate that you receive after this broadcast to the appropriate board. PSMJ does not um, uh, say that any all the boards will accept this type of credit. You'll have to you know, learn from them. And also you could reach out to us at customer service at psmj.com. Also, if you need that certificate for um, internal means uh, to prove that you went to training, that's fine too. So lastly, that brings us to the email that I'll send. Um, I do try to send it at night, but maybe I'll send it tomorrow morning, depending on if I get all the information back. But there's a handout. Uh, you can download that now anytime. Uh, that will be a link for that. Uh, the certificate of attendance, and the recorded on-demand version of the broadcast. This broadcast will also be on the PSMJ Podcast Presents channel. If you don't already subscribe, please. Um, we're on all, all the podcast platforms. We're on Spotify, iTunes. Um, it, it lives on SoundCloud, though. If you want to just go on SoundCloud and follow us there, that would be great. So keep an eye out for all that. Now that it's out of the way, all that stuff, I'd like to dig in with Brian, and I'm pleased to welcome Brian Flynn. How are you, Brian? I am good. How are you all doing? I think um, we got a few people here, uh, close to 100 now, so they're 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 filing in. Um, as just to give us a background, Brian, I know um, we're gonna, you know, we have an hour set aside. I'm not sure if we're gonna take the whole hour, but we're not in any rush, but could you please tell us a little bit about your work with AE and also, um, you know, your work with, you You are an engineer, so what is your financial performance background? Uh, okay, well, my work with A&E firms basically is to help them figure out how to improve their profitability. And I think we've got a unique approach to it it's a model-based approach. It's very rational, logical. Uh, it provides them with the tools they need to, um, to go forward and increase their profitability. But even more important than that, I work with them uh, either remotely or on site to get them to figure out what they can do to improve profitability themselves. And so when we're finished, they have a plan. It's an actionable plan. It's an actual list with people responsible for it and deadlines that they have generated with my help. So it's their plan, their schedule, and their people. It's not a expert riding in on a chariot uh, pronouncing on high what I think you all need to do and then give them a report and then they, they have to then implement it. Because my experience was I did that earlier in my career and reports usually sat on the shelf. Right. And that's right. not the case with this kind of approach. Now, people tell me, and this is a little bit of a curveball, this is not in our uh, script, so to speak, but they tell me you could look at a P&L and you could see if something's out of whack just by really examining it. Is that true? Uh, for starters, yes. Wow. Uh, okay. It, it's it, 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 You may be speaking to, wait a minute, this guy's an engineer, he's not an accountant, <laughs> what does he know? 
Um, and right. when, when I was in this business back in the day, uh, our firm generated a 40% profit on net revenue year after year. Mm. And our prices were not high. They were pretty much the same as our competitors. And it was done that way. It worked out that way because we had a lot of internal efficiencies. Uh, and basically, I, you know, I learned from, from making it like that how, how it actually worked. And then I, once I kind of got out of the business uh, of execution, I started doing management consulting and found that, that everything I'd learned on the job was directly translatable to other A and E firms. They're, they have a lot of similarities. Right. I know your book says um, maximizing engineering firm profits, but really it's architectural firms too, as well, right? Small business. Uh, frankly, any firm that sell basically sells right personnel hours mm -hmm. can use this book. It could be an accounting firm or a law firm. It'll still work for them. Right, right. Okay. They get enough ideas out of it. So now I, I was wondering, um, I know you came to me with the uh, financial stress test tool, which is an Excel based tool, and you're going to show it to us in, in a few. But um, what, how did this come about? Like, what did you, why did you create this? I know I'm, you might have been working with a client, I don't know, but how did it, how did it come about? What, why? Oh, well, because I, was exclusively working from home and was saving on travel time. Right. I started to notice that I was eating too much pizza and <laughs> watching too many cat videos on YouTube. And so I thought, what could I do that would might be additionally useful? Obviously, I'm kidding a little bit. Right. Uh, but basically, I said, it, it, this is the, the origin is kind of like this. The, I've had a number of clients in the last few years that when I work with them, they would kind of reminisce about the horrible days back in the Great Recession of 2008, 2009. And they all said the same thing. We waited too long right. to react to the bad situation. And I realized that one of the reasons they waited too long was that they weren't really ready. They hadn't done anything that looked like planning. And it occurred to me that the federal government makes banks do financial stress testing on their balance sheets hmm. uh, in order to make sure they have an adequate amount of capital. And basically, you could apply that technique to an A&E firm um, and basically ask yourself, well, how much of a rainy day fund do I need in case something really goes wrong? And then how do I get there? How do I get, how do I put it together? And yeah. from those, that kind of thinking, the stress test tool emerged. Right, because I mean, we didn't know this was gonna happen. I mean, we always say, I know that Dave always talks about a um, black swan or something that you're not expecting. Right. So you don't expect it. That's the whole idea, so. Right, um, and, and you lose valuable time trying to get all your partners on board once the crisis hits right. to get them to understand how bad it is and what kind of response you're going to make and a little pre-planning would make it make that part of the the exercise a lot easier well it's always easier to to share something concrete too so well, before we get to that though let's let's see if uh, if people um i know this is a few months into covid and we were just talking before we went on air about you know hopefully this is going to bounce back quickly and so forth and so on but let's see how people are feeling we'll do a quick poll um let me just share it and the question is how concerned are you about uh your workload your pipeline you know getting getting new business in um or business from your clients um you know in 12 months you know one year from now um and so we'll let people if everyone would try to get their votes in it's just a quick poll all right, I think I think that's good. One more second, and then I'll um I'll close it and share. All right, we got a lot of people voting. Okay, let me close and launch and, and share everything we have. Um, hope everyone can see that. It says no worries, two percent, mildly concerned, thirty-four percent, 
concerned is 60%, which is the biggest. And then they are 4% are scared. So um, what do you think about that, Brian? Is that typical or maybe we can help a little? Actually, it's the first time we've asked that question in that in the in the context of a year. Right. You've been asking people, you know, what do you think is going to happen in the near term? I'm not surprised. There, there's an awful lot of uncertainty, and that always spooks people who are mm -hmm. in business. And, you know, basically it's saying here out of 100 people, 98 have some level of concern. Right. Right. Including a fair amount of concern, 60% when you're concerned. That's so that that's just another another data point that says um, if you follow the wisdom of the crowd, you might want to think about pre-planning if you haven't already done that. Right. And um, it, and doing also is good to just progress forward. I know I talked to Susan Israel. She was talking about strategic planning and um, this tool will help. Pre, you know, that's that could be a precursor and you'll have some, you know, planning and also communicating with people in the firm that. Um, you're doing something, you're, you're planning, you're looking ahead. So specifically, the stress test tool, what is it supposed to do? What is its function? Okay, it basically, you you input your p &L into the tool. So it's got a base to start with. And then basically, you can run scenarios that, stress your firm in two fundamental ways. The most important fundamental way is that you have a drop in workload and the tool uses hours sold, okay? And that, that works whether you got lump sum, some form of time and materials, whatever. It's, you, can, you can input a reduction in hours sold which means you're just getting less work. And then also on top of that, you can input a reduction as to what you think might happen in terms of your rates. Clients are starting to make noises about, well, you should give me a discount. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can input that in there. So that's the stress. Um, the test part maybe is what's your response? And there are two fundamental responses built into the program. One is you want to do an across the board salary cut. If so, how big is it? You put that in and your non labor overhead costs, which ones can you cut? How much could you cut them fairly quickly? If you had to, you can input that. So that's basically, that's basically what the model's doing. And then uh, once you put all that together, you can see, all right, what happens um, when the, when I implement the cuts and there's no change in my market, the profit goes up. But then what happens when I, when I now have two different levels of discounts and workload reductions? Mm -hmm. What happens to me then? And the other thing you can do with the model is you can input a reduction in full-time equivalent employees into your two stress test, stress test cases to see what that would do for you in terms of improving your financial situation. Now, before we go to the tool and you can show us and you go through it step by step, um, I know you showed it to me, It's I think it's great, but um, what people are already running scenarios. What's, um, what can this do for me? What, you know, um, what can this tool add if we're already running scenarios and? Well, um, my experience is that people are running scenarios in which they're saying, how much could I cut my costs? Yeah. And a lot of people who are concerned, you know, they've already done that. Uh, a, a common, a common occurrence that I keep hearing is we cut our salaries across the board by 10%. Right. And some people have cut some of their non-labor overhead costs. Everybody has had some reduction in those costs because they can't travel as much as they used to. And that number is dropping. So I think there's a lot of that going on, but I'm not sure there's an awful lot of saying, well, 
what happens under certain scenarios that I might guess at in the future. And that's where this tool comes in. Okay. And the other thing, strangely oh. enough, is the tool can do two other things for you. Uh, one is it can point the way to improving your short-term profitability, whether or not your workload goes down, which is a real plus. Right. And the other thing it can do is for your senior project managers and your partners, mm -hmm. it can serve as a training tool. They can play with the thing and see what happens under different conditions so that they get a better appreciation of where they are and what they might have to do if they want to try to stay there. Yeah, you might be, um, we have a PM group that you might be able to show them that this stress test, it might be a, a good learning uh, tool for them. Um, I right. know it's an eye opener when one thing changes and it's great. All right, so let me um, make you the presenter. Let's, with no, you know, with no further ado, uh, I'll make you the presenter. And um, if you can. Okay, can you see my screen now? Not yet. Let me see. All right. That means I need to hit this show my screen. Yeah, button. you're going to have to do that. I lied to you. I said that you didn't have to do that. But right. I see it now. You do? Yes, okay. you do. All right. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to give a quick guided tour of the stress test spreadsheet. Right. If and you look while, down, and ask, while you do that, I am going to just monitor the Q&A. And so I might interrupt a little, as I just did. And um, so... Um, okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Anyway, um, if you look, if you start, if you look at the tabs at the bottom, why and when, I'm not going to go there, but basically this is a short treatise on the, what the tool can do for you. And also, uh, some thoughts on building and uh, building a rainy day fund. Okay. Some some clients I worked with have it, and some have never even thought about it. Hmm. Uh, the directions, that's obvious. There's, there's a number of directions. You should follow them carefully. It's not rocket science, but it'd be, care, it'd be careful. For one thing, I will point out, I think the most important direction I have there is make a copy of the thing and then play with it. And keep the original, because we're leaving this Excel spreadsheet open you can change it to suit yourself. And so uh, if you choose to do that, you don't want to lose the original in case you get lost somewhere and you need to start over again. Okay, but this is the heart of it, the base case and the scenarios. In the base case, we've got a 100-person firm. I put numbers in here that are you know, reasonably typical. Um, and it's got the total revenue of $20 million. You can see we're using thousands of dollars here. This is an annual one. You could do it on a monthly basis if you wanted to. And it's got a net revenue of 15 and a half million. Okay. I put us, this is a split screen right here. So I'm showing you the bottom line at the same time we're playing with this online. But this firm has total costs north of 13 million. It has a profit, a gross profit of two, I shouldn't say gross profit, it's just got a profit of two million bucks. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at it on an EBITDA basis, in other words, account for bonuses, interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, it's closer to three million. Uh, it's, the difference between the two is about 800,000, and this is typical for a firm of likely that size. About 500,000 of that is bonuses. Okay. So they're, they're added back in in that line. So its return on net using the EBITDA number is about 18%, which is close to the average for AE firms. Last year, I think we all averaged a little bit more than 19%. Okay. Well, someone this asks, um, how do, how do, do it? is amortization dealt with in calculating EBITDA? How is, uh, I, I missed one word, you say utilization? Uh, it, amortal, um, amortization? Oh, am, amortization. I'm sorry. Uh, right, uh, amortization is the retiring of principal on loans. 
and it's added back into the base profit in order to get you part of the way to even. So we're looking at a typical scenario that you've seen that you see. Out yeah. There. Okay. Yeah, I pick numbers. Um, right. That kind of represent what kind of an average A and E firm would look like when it's around twenty million in total revenue. Okay. It, you know, it varies obviously. And one thing I'll point out is that the the line items in my spreadsheet move up here a little bit. can vary a little bit from client to client. I've never looked at two P&Ls that were set up exactly the same way. They're generally pretty much the same way, but there's differences. And that's one of the reasons we left the coding in this thing open. So you wanted to add a line that you like that's not on here, you can put it in there. Okay? So having said that, one of the things you can do right up front when you're working in this column, the second column, this is you're brainstorming what kind of cuts you could make. So you could choose to put in an across the board payroll cut cost reduction, and you can put it right here. Okay, and that's gonna slash your payroll costs by 10%. Um, in the real world, uh, generally I've seen firms do well, 10% for the technical people, maybe 5% for the non-technical, and for the partners, maybe we're gonna do 15%. So in that case, you'd have to kind of calculate yourself an overall average number and throw it in there. But it's up to you, okay? So you can put that in, and then I blacked out areas where I believe in the short term you have very little chance of reducing costs, okay? Obvious one is uh, medical and dental insurance. Unless I start lopping people off, I'm not going to reduce any costs there. And it goes on and on. And let me just point out a few. Here's here's an example of a line item, conference fees. I decided to eliminate them. So the eliminations are put in as positive numbers, the size of my cut, okay? I'm not gonna do any travel training. Remember, this is purportedly an emergency, okay? So these are the kinds of things you're looking at doing. Um, computer and CAD, I put in a, mo a very modest because I think if I'm still doing most of the workload I had, I can't really save much money there. Um, now, there's some that might look a little strange. Rent, uh, classic fixed cost, but in this case, I left room to put something in there because maybe you have a way of reducing rent. Either maybe you got a small office that's not performing and you decide you're gonna close that space, uh, or maybe you have the ability to sublet some space and in an emergency, you would consider doing it, okay? So I, I put that I put that in there just for fun. You don't have to put it in and make it zero if you want. And so it goes on and on. Another one that's worth looking at is bad debt expense. So I put minus 100 in here. I had budgeted 50, but I have a minus 100, or I actually got 50 on an annualized basis. The minus 100 says my bad debt expense is going to go up. So if I think an expense like that's going to go up, I input a negative number. You can see in the next column, which is the base case plus the cuts, it goes up to 150 like it should. Okay. If you, if you look down kind of at the bottom line, those cuts increased my profitability by about a million and a half dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, Probably half of that, half of that or so is due to the salary cuts, a little more than half. And the other half is due to these non-labor overhead cuts. And my return on net jumps to 28. And this kind of begs the question, in normal times, if you've gone through this exercise and you have the luxury of time and you say, uh, gee, maybe, maybe some of those things that I cut in the non-labor overhead, I ought to do anyway. Now, you know, it's a, a mixed bag. Right. I pointed out not going to conferences anymore. I don't think you want to do that. If you're already <laughs> at a, a reasonable level of professional education, you want to keep that. But there are some other things that you may decide you could do. And if you could do it, why not? Well, what um, really um, 
presents itself here is that I'm looking at my my numbers in a really consistent way. Like I'm not coming back and looking at it a different way. I mean, once everyone agrees that this is what we're going to look at, which that right. could be a, a conversation, obviously, um, it, it really does give us consistency. And I, have you any idea how often we should do this? I mean, we're going to do this now, but I mean, I'll have a boss that wants to look at this every week or something. Well, yeah, I, I kind of have two answers to that. Uh, right now, given the uncertainty with the COVID epidemic, if you haven't already done it, you better. Do it right away. Better do it, do it right away, within a reasonable amount of time, within the next week or two. Um, and it, I think the best way to do that is to is to get together your management group and uh, at, at a minimum. And you may want to go further than your management group. It's up to you. Okay. It depends on your culture and how you make decisions, especially big ones. Right. Uh, and obviously, this tool makes it easier, but you can always be doing this on your own. You I mean some right. people have already? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Created. Now, the second, the second answer is that I think normally you ought to revisit this like once a year, because mm -hmm. I think one of the things that should drop out of this might be some modest improvements to to profitability overall. And the other thing that should drop out of it is some serious thought about a rainy day fund, whether or not I have one, a lot of firms don't, some firms do, but then they should be asking themselves, is it really adequate after I look at some of these scenarios? Should I, should I have a bigger rainy day fund? And then as you go along, how am I doing in generating that rainy day fund? So that's, that's kind of my answer. There's no, there's no perfect answer, but mm -hmm. that's something, something to think about. All right, so now if you go, you go back up to the top of the spreadsheet, you say, all right, I have, I have put in my base case, I put in the cuts I want, including a payroll reduction, and now I've simply added the two together. And this is kind of base case after cuts, okay? It's still the same number of people. You'll notice the average pay went down by 10% because I told it to. Mm -hmm. I'm still selling the amount of the same number of labor dollars, which is calculated based on the hours sold and the average billing rate. Okay. So no wonder my profits went up. They had right. to. Okay. All right. But now this kind of gives me a secondary base, if you will. And now I can play. I can say, all right, how about a moderate case scenario? And what I did in this moderate case scenario is I maintained the 10% pay cuts. I said this, the clients got me for a 20% reduction in billing rate, and I'm getting 25% less work volume in terms of hours sold. So that's a substantial hit. Okay. When you look at the bottom line here, which I've tried to keep in view a little bit anyway, the EBITDA profit basically is break even. Okay, my return on net is a fraction of a percent. Had I get there, well, it was the salary cut of 10%, the cuts of non-labor overhead that went into this column, and a riff of 20 people. Hurts, okay? Uh, there's nobody on this phone call that wants to reduce their workforce unless they have to, okay? This tool told you that if you reduce by 20, once that bad scenario hits, you'll break even. So you won't be, you won't be bleeding money. But here is the obvious advantage of the tool. I'll put 100 in for that case. In other words, I didn't do anything except cut salaries and make the non-labor overhead cost cuts. And what happened? Um, bleeding two million dollars a year okay. at the EBITDA level. Now this is not a cash flow model, but frankly, I was always able to when I worked in every day in this business, I could tell pretty much from profitability what my cash flow was going to look like when it equilibrated. 
okay? And it isn't an awful lot different. Uh, there's time lags built into it, but basically this is saying something like, in very round numbers, is if the moderate case hits and I don't reduce my force right away, I'm bleeding a, on the average of $150,000 a month, and I got to ask myself, how long can I sustain that and, right. and run the risk of running out of money, okay? The worst case, I'll point out, I haven't, I haven't changed this. I put a huge reduction in force here. I rift 55 people, and the model per force assumes that it was a reduction in force that was balanced, okay? And you may not choose to do it that way. But when I did that, that kept me at roughly the break-even level, too. But it's a bloodbath, hmm. okay? Those of you who are uh, reasonably good at playing with Excel know that they can go to this cell and tell it to iterate that number until my profit down here goes to zero. And that can give you an exact number of FTEs and the, to balance the moderate case to zero. Because my numbers were approximate when I, when I did it, when mm -hmm. I did this. Okay. Right. All right. So those are the games you can play. The bloodbath, the worst case is you can say, what could really go wrong? And you got this discount and you're only selling half as much work. Now, to put my management consultants hat on, you might plan for this kind of billing rate reduction, or maybe it's 10 percent or whatever you think you, you sense from the marketplace. But then there are things that you can do to avoid those discounts. Uh, principally, going to more of a lump sum environment with your clients, trying to push them in that direction so that you're not exposing your hourly rates and then manage the projects to keep them tightly on budget so that they come in at normal profit levels or even above. Okay. This is where project management and training project managers is going to really pay huge dividends. So the 20% doesn't have to be. The reduction in hours sold, uh, I know it's kind of anathema sometimes to say it, but I think the biggest effect on your hours sold is the marketplace itself. Uh, if the marketplace drops 25%, that's probably what's going to happen to you. Um, some people are bigger believers in the effect of actively marketing than others. Uh, I'm kind of in the middle on it. I think actively marketing can help you, but I don't think it can turn it around. If the marketplace dropped 25 percent. Right. I don't think it's going to grow 10 percent unless you find unless you can find yourself a new hot niche to get into and do it pretty quickly. Now, someone asks. Um... How does the model account for fixed versus variable costs? Oh, good point. They caught me asleep at the wheel by asking that question. <laughs> we tried to show here three categories, uh, things that are proportional to net revenue. There's a few things, things that are considered to be fixed costs in this model, and things that are, are considered to be proportional to FTEs. Let's see if we can pick a few examples here. Medical and dental insurance. Right. You can pretty much cut that according to whatever size riff you did. You got to go to the insurance company. You got to have various time lags depending who's insuring you, but I don't think you should be stuck for a whole contract year with the total cost. Okay. Life insurance, same thing. Uh, federal taxes, FICA, things like that, that's going to happen. Um, Someone asks, I'm just curious, is it, is it safe to say that one could use a spreadsheet for the opposite? Um, if ever in the situation compared to base salary, one could stress test the, the firm capacity if we may have too much work. And how long do we feel like they um, like that may last without hiring more staff? Well, well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
is one of the hidden values of the thing because if you look at if you look at the top here, uh, you can play with this and you could you could call you could say moderate case growth if you wanted to, and you could input a higher number of hours sold, leave your FTEs where they were before that happened, and see what happens. Now you may find that your utilization gets too high, which means you can't support your overhead functions properly, especially marketing new work. Uh, I'll give you a rule of thumb though, is that uh, I don't get too worried if your utilization hits 75%. Uh, once it starts getting beyond that, for a number of firms, I would be concerned about getting some of your non-project but essential type work done. But yeah, you can you can trick the sheet into doing that kind of thing for you. You could you could trick it into getting better billing rates by making that number a negative number. And there's all sorts of games you can play with it. You could also simplify it. Oh, let me point something out. We got this is a mistake here. This is proportional FTEs. It's not fixed. The fixed the fixed column. They're all here. They're not mixed into here. We'll okay. fix it though before it goes out to anybody. Yeah. Um, okay, so the, you, uh, the, your CFO probably could do, or president could probably do a pretty good job of taking your own uh, P&L and combining all of the fixed items and all the items that you think are proportional to FTEs, or maybe if you're more sophisticated, some items that you think have a base level that uh, that exists regardless of the number of FTEs, but then the rest of it is proportional FTEs. You could do that and collapse all your costs, your your non-labor costs, down to those three lines, and have a very simplified model, and and run it to your heart's content, and not have to look at all of the individual line items that are on here if you don't want to. Now, someone says, um, what do I do if my costs do not quite fit the template? Um, well, yeah, yeah, you, you, could, you could insert other cost lines in here using your Excel skills. All you got to do is watch that the subtotals uh, are still picking it up. Um, in some cases, there's something called other, and you could jam your costs in there. But I think between the two, uh, you can get what you want. Or some of these things, um, people call them different things, like, for instance, payroll variance. Some people call it payroll differential. Um, you can just change the title if you want. Uh, I mean, all, the thing is the, the code's open, so there's all sorts of things you could do with it. You might find you have something you want to put in there that's an item that could replace something that's already in there that you don't use on your P&L. Right. So any way you want to do it. Or hide whatever rows you don't want to see and so forth. Well, yeah, you got to be careful of hiding, though, because then you'll see them. Whatever total was <laughs> downloaded in there by yours truly, and you don't want to do that. I've it's done gonna... I've done that before. <laughs> yeah, everybody's done that before. <laughs> All right, so let's um, let's cover that. If if no one else, let me see if anyone else has any specific questions right right now. I mean, they can still ask you questions, but let's ask about the rainy day funds. I mean, I know that you're a proponent. Um, I know that we've had um, just some small business gurus on that say they want to see six months of um, people, you know, saving for a rainy day and it's it it was it's been pouring so um hopefully it's it's starting to um clear up but let's ask another poll question uh to see if people where they stand with this but uh the question is does your firm maintain a rainy day fund just either yes or no and we'll um we'll do this quickly um and then All right, I'm going to close it in a couple of seconds once we reach a good amount of people. All right, and let me share what we got. 57% say yes, 43% no. Does that 
surprise you? Uh, no, that's usually what I find. Some people have it, some don't. A lot of times they don't even mention it unless you ask about it. Right. And I, um, yeah, I know I think most, well, around the office, people just kind of um, argue about what should be in the, the fund more than how much should be in the fund more than should you have one. Um, some people just say have a credit line, but now I'm thinking, what if the credit line wa is not available, if that changes, right? Um, so what are your thoughts about that? You mean a credit line relative to a rainy day fund? No, just in, in say, well, I don't have a rainy day fund, but I have a credit line. So, um, oh, oh, okay. You've fallen into my punchy <laughs> stick trap. Uh, ignore it. Ignore the line of credit. I am, uh, uh, maybe I'm kind of a gloomy guy, even though I live in Texas, you know, we're, we're all die wool optimists, but I have a bad feeling that if push comes to shove, your bank will withdraw your line of credit when you really need it the most. Right, right. That's and what I, mean, I would not, I would not count on it. Uh, typically I try to teach firms to use their line of credit to get them over a minor cash flow hitch at the end of the year when they're trying to bonus out as much money as they possibly can. Oh, okay. All right, so Which let's ask... Another point, though. Oh, go ahead. If your firm is highly profitable, uh, part of your rainy day fund could be um, your cash accumulation during the year that normally occurs. I put oh. some numbers on it. Suppose there's 20... 20 um, this 15 and a half million net revenue firm um, in ordinarily ordinary times is generating make it round numbers two and a half million a year in cash okay at equilibrium all right two and a half million they're generating a quarter of a million a month or no I got, I got my two hundred thousand a month okay mm -hmm. okay uh, as they get into their year, around the middle of the year, they've got a million bucks there about because maybe they paid they paid down their line of credit because at the beginning of the year they bonused everything out they could. So it's not unreasonable to include that as sort of a number or a base for your rainy day fund. Where you got to do the heavy thinking is how big do you want that fund to be? Okay, and, well, why don't we ask the audience what they think and then we'll... Okay. Excuse me? Can we uh, do a poll question, ask them what they think? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. So the question is, um, I've, I've shared it. How big is your rainy day fund compared to average monthly billing? Again, we don't have a fund that would just take care of that, but less than a month's uh, worth, one to three months, and greater than three months. So if everyone can try to take that quick poll, this is the third and final poll question. Just let let people know that. Um, and we're close to a good size. A couple more seconds, and then I'll share. Okay, let me uh, let me close it and share. Okay, again, thirty one percent. We don't have a fund. Uh, less than a month, twelve percent. Thirty seven percent, one to three months, and twenty percent greater than three months. Okay, Did that's interesting. That? Okay, so what do you think about that? Those numbers. Uh, well, um, I guess fifty seven percent in the prior question didn't have a rainy day fund, and now it's dropped to thirty one percent. Probably because they have now realized that the, some of the cash they accumulate during a normal year could be credited to a rainy day fund. Right, right. It's sitting, yeah. it's sitting there but, and collecting you know, interest. And but stuff. I'm, yeah, I'm not surprised. I thought it would probably be, probably be spread among those four categories. Um, the thing is, is that um, what the size of that fund should be is. It's sort of like it's actually it's exactly like personal investing. It's how much risk are you willing to tolerate? Right. That's one, one factor. Another factor is how quickly can you generate a rainy day fund if you think you're short? And if your profit margin is five percent, it's probably going to take you forever. Uh, if it's thirty percent, it probably won't take you long. 
Okay. Um, I've, I've seen experiences all over the map. I, I got a good client. They have, they have a rainy day fund, which is about 25% of their total revenue for the year. So yes, yeah, 3%. It's three months worth. Right. And of course, that's a, that's three months of revenue. Uh, you're not in, even in the worst case, you're not going to deplete it in three months because you're going to have some revenue coming in. Correct. And, you know, you kind of have, in a sense, you have the present revenue coming in. As your revenue goes down over time, your cash still is flowing in from past billings. And that actually provides a bit of a, cu a cushion. And if your CFO is really sophisticated, they can kind of play with that and see what that does for your, um, uh, for your rainy day fund. They can kind of model it. So for an engineer, think of it as an unsteady state model. Um, so I don't think there's a right answer. I mean, if somebody says to me, well, what would you do? I have no idea what to do. I'd say, well, you know, cover 6%, uh, I mean, uh, six months of revenue if you can. That would be a very healthy fund, but, um, you know, use your common sense too. So we have some questions about the rainy day fund. So let's see if we can just jump to the questions, which is where, where I was going next. So, um one is, can you give a recommendation for a rainy day fund? Would you set this as a multiplier of number of payroll, percentage of total expenses? Can you do that instead? Also, any guidance on tax implications of building a rainy day fund for a C-Core? Uh, let me take that in reverse order. Okay. The, the tax consequences... Uh, let me just say that I'm not a tax accountant, okay? Yeah. But I think... We've had a couple uh, of questions on the tax, so that'll be good. That'll, I, you know. I'm, I'm pretty sure that as you as you retain more earnings in your C-type corp, uh, you're going to have to pay taxes. So you're going to have to account for that uh, in terms of how big do you want your fund to be and how are you going to build it. Now, past crews are more familiar with tax consequences. Basically... I'll make a simple example. If you make, if you only made a million, if you made a million dollars in, and, and you, and you, you're doing cash basis accounting for taxes, which is what most of you do, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to owe taxes on that. Ordinarily, you try to bonus it out so that um, the partners got the use of the money and then they paid the taxes rather than the corporation or LLC. If you said, I'm going to retain that in a, reta in a rainy day fund, uh, then basically um, you're going to have to pay the partners enough money as an earnings distribution so that they can pay their share of the taxes right. that the corporation right. is going to have to do. I'm not sure if Chris is asking, how, how separate do you suggest we keep the rainy day fund from operational funds? Um. I would keep it. I would keep it in a separate account. Frankly, yeah. that's just me. I mean, you can keep track of the numbers and have whatever cash you have all in one account. Right. But the reason I say a separate account is, is that I think you might invest it a tad differently than you invest your normal cash that's accumulating every year. I mean, if it were me, the cash I'm accumulating during the year, I'm going to try to keep it in a money market fund that's above money market rates. So sometimes you got to do some shuffling of money. Um, I might put it in the right circumstances in the short term CDs. Right. Uh, but uh, if I had a rainy day fund and uh, I've got money in it, eh, some of it I might put into a short term or intermediate term bond fund and get Today, you could get 2 or 3% interest on it. Right. But again, you got to cut the fit. You have to think about what your risk tolerance is and what you think would happen to that investment uh, if the whole economy was starting to go north, as we say here in the south. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, why would the fund be based on billing and, uh, versus your expenses? Uh, it doesn't have to be. I just picked that because it is easy to visualize. It could be. You can just say, what am I rock bottom? Right, to cover, yeah. Which basically to me is kind of like 
pretty close somewhere to net revenue minus uh, uh, profit. You might have uh, answered this already, but can the rainy day fund be certain number of months of working capital, which is kind of the same kind of question? Yeah. 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 Um, in EBITDA, are taxes, all taxes, in, uh, for example, payroll taxes and business taxes, or is it just business taxes? Oh, the tax in EBITDA refers to corporate level taxes, or in the case of pass-throughs, the taxes that the, that the um, partners are responsible for. Okay. And that usually washes out because a lot of firms will they'll bonus money to the partners so and the bonus pay. includes, if you will, uh, spendable money on the part of the partner and money that the partner is going to have to give up in taxes. Okay. So let's, um, if you can give, uh, I'll take back the screen for a minute because we could always go back, keep up the spreadsheet in case someone has a question. Cause I'm okay. going to open, please. Um, I'm going to open it up to um, questions right now. Um, people have been asking questions, so it's great. Um, we do appreciate it. But I just want to let people know people have been asking, how can I get the stress test tool? Well, um, Brian has made it available. If you buy his two books that we have online, you can get it by going to www.psmnj.com backslash profit fundamentals. If you buy one or more of his books, you can get it for free. And it's a $57 value. Um, and, and it's there too separately. But as we said, now that you've seen it, you, you kind of get the idea you can make your own, of course. And, um, and we can help you with that, obviously. Um, so I just wanted people to know uh, that that's available. Um, and some people have already bought your book, so you know if they want to um, just buy the tool. Um, Brian did come up with the tool, and uh, when we do these podcasts, we do pay our presenters and stuff like that. So um, that would be very helpful. I think you, you made it at a, at a low price, so I do appreciate it. Um, let me see if we have any more questions. Yes, someone said they already bought the book. Can can you get the tool? Yeah, we're making it available for a price. Um, if that's the, you know, if you um, just give us a call um, and we can talk to you about um, the price of the tool. We'd like to get it to everybody. So, uh, yeah, someone people are saying they bought the they bought the books. We have the books are very popular. I might say. Um, so we have a number of people that um, have done that. All right. So um, anything else you want to cover? I'm looking to see if anyone else has any questions. Um, anyone can put in any questions? Uh, okay. We have one. Um, I think you ran over this already, but how often should we be running the scenarios? She, she's saying like right now. Okay. So if we do the scenario, should we look at it in a month or uh, a week? Uh, yeah, you should do it now. Um, I would say that if you look at the assumptions you made for the moderate and worst case scenarios, if something happens in the near future that makes you want to revisit those scenarios, then yeah, you better run it again. Yeah. Um, a lot of people asked, um, well, not a lot, a couple of people asked that what metric could they, in general, could they be looking at to um, find that they are clawing their way back? Like if they had to look at one um, key on their P&L, what would be something that um, that they could look at and say, okay, now we, we need to be starting hiring people back or when they're doing these scenarios? Right. Well. Um... I think most people would define as being all the way back as being approximately at the net revenue I had before whatever the crisis is. And but we were really going high, though. I mean, we were really doing I, I mean, I'm not saying we as <laughs> but most firms were doing very, very well. Right. Well, I don't think you want to back off from that. I mean, 
right. this theoretical firm here, they were running at 18% return on net, and that's what they should be aiming to do after they recover. And their their net revenue should be at least equal to what it was before things went in the wrong direction. Right, because it was no bubble burst or anything. It should really kind of start leveling off too. You know what I mean? There was no bubble to break or you know, any specific market that um, is not going to come back, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Hmm. Probably. We don't know, though. We I don't mean, know. We, we don't know. know. We just don't know what's going to happen. So if we I mean, set... I'm, I'm fairly optimistic, but, you know, I want to plan for the worst and you always the... you, you always plan for the worst. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's say um person asks, let's say we set up a process. How do we get leadership to understand the urgency? The for the rainy day fund, for the planning? What are your suggestions? Uh wow. Um the first thing is I, I would I would wonder why leadership already isn't concerned. I mean, in this poll you just did, 98% were concerned, right? Right. right. Um, that would kind of be telling me something else if they didn't have any, didn't have any concern at all. Uh, either they're you're in an awfully good market niche that just can't, that's bulletproof, uh, or you're not paying attention. But how are you going to get them to pay attention? I guess uh, <laughs> it's education. You're going to have to start. Um, start getting to understand what could go wrong and what effect it could have on the bottom line and on leadership's pocketbooks. Or the urgency uh, to use the, use a, a tool, not just this one, but just any kind of scenario. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, and that, that kind of speaks to a broader thing. Mm -hmm. A number of times I've gotten hired because the CFO thought they could do substantially better, but couldn't get management to buy into it. Okay. Yeah. And so I think that's a role for the CFO uh, kind of in this case is if the CFO is concerned that there isn't enough planning being done for right. a potential downturn, they've got to educate the partner group by whatever means necessary. Now, you know, my technique, which isn't the only way to do it, is to pick them off one at a time. Uh, assuming I got some time, uh, who's most amenable to to understanding why, if I'm the CFO, I'm concerned about the future, um, and then start to build myself a crowd, pick one off and another and another, until they're willing to sit down together and talk about it. Yeah, I think we went over the um, registration list a little bit, and we do have a lot of people who are in charge of the books, so to speak. And that maybe they're one partner and they have to get the others on board. So they're on right. board, but just, you know, to have a consistent way to look at things. Or um, if you got, if you have a fairly strong president leadership model, that's the person you got to, to convince. Right. Right. Uh, and you know, your biggest argument I think is twofold. It's going to hit your pocketbook if you're not careful. And the other one is, Mm -hmm. Do you want to be forced into a riff, which everybody hates? Well, one of the other things um, I think Susan Israel was talking about was just the culture and the staff uh, knowing that planning is being done. It's consistent. There's a process. They feel that um, it, there's enough, you know, enough attention. It's not seat of the pants, that sort of thing. So. But she said, right. communicate that out, not just do, don't do it and put it on a shelf like you said, but do it and uh, stick by what you um, have found. Or you Oh, know. yeah. Yeah, and I didn't have my HR hat when I was talking about it. But, yes, yeah, I think you do. You need to do that so that employees are reassured. They see, they see the level of uncertainty out there. Right. A little bit better knowing that you've done some pre-planning. Right. And you have a base uh, benchmark to to go back to, and you know, or you say when um, we reach this specific benchmark, we're going to start the furloughs. We're going to bring people back, and that sort of thing. Um, you'll have some numbers, right? Right. 
All right. Well, that brings us to one o'clock. Um, again, you know, if people need um, a um, question that we didn't get to, please, uh, I'll put my, let me put my um, email address. Um, I could share. Brian is yeah, just you, B. You Flynn. You can ask at, questions on to me and I'll be happy to answer yep. them. Let me give you mine and I can give you Brian's. He's just um, B. Flynn at PSMJ. So um, thank you so much, everyone, um, for coming. And um, we hope to do it again, Brian. How about that? All right. You talk me into it. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. And uh, please reach out if you need anything. Thank you all for your attention. Have a great day.